This is what my gravity flyer looks like today. However, it didn't always look like this. Come with me on a journey and I'll show you exactly where I started and where I'm at today. This is the first gravity flyer that I ever built. I was so proud of it. I thought I did everything Alexi did. I had built my center plate. Back then I thought it was two plates put together as one. I used a set of old vacuum machine motors. I even built both plates, top and bottom. They looked pretty clean. They were fairly straight. I even used tracks from a screen door to connect my motor plates. I just wanted the look to be right. I got it up and spinning for the first time. It was something to see. I even got the high voltage put into it. I had to cut down the center plate because it was just too big. But man, was it ever fun to run. It used to shake across the table like crazy and put out a tremendous amount of static electricity. Unfortunately, this model never lifted, but that wasn't gonna keep me down. A few months later, I built version two, where the first one weighed about 12 pounds. This one only weighed three pounds. I thought by removing as much weight as I possibly could, that this thing actually might start to take flight. I removed the old vacuum machine motors and put in a set of brushless DC motors. I didn't know if they were gonna hold up with the high voltage, but the small size made them optimal for a craft that has to be super light. As you can see, I also got rid of the big all threads. They were one of the things that made the craft the heaviest. The metal bars that I put in their place were perfect. They gave me the perfect distance for my motors. They also held the craft together really well. They were also really light. One of the unfortunate parts about them was they weren't very stiff. So you would see a lot of bouncing going on every time I turned it on. The cords themselves were monsters back then. I'd find anything I could to use on this thing. Old electrical cords from a saw, anything. I even used coax cables as my high voltage leads. They work pretty good. There's a lot of insulation in there. So as you use them, they didn't bleed through and shock the living daylights out of you. Speaking of high voltage, this is the first high voltage test that I did. It was a complete disaster. All of the bolts that I put in there that were metal started to spark over. So I would never get the voltage on the plate. I had to switch everything to a nylon bolt. But once I got everything working together, man, was it a sight to see. You turn off the lights at night and you get this beautiful plasma glow. It would just come right around the plate. Every single time it went around, it looked like it started a brand new piece of plasma as it went around. It was a gorgeous sight to see. Once in a while, it would spark over. So, you had to adjust the distance on your plates, but man, this thing looked beautiful. You know, for all the work that I put into this, I could never get this thing to stop shaking. So I decided just to take out the bottom motor. I put it in my hand and then I would run it. It turned out to be a great stabilizing force. Every time you move your hand, the disc would follow and stay there. Every time you moved it again, it would do the same. It didn't matter if it was on its side or if it was on its top. This thing was just stabilization. Next, I wanted to find out what the magnets were actually doing. So I took out the center plate and I decided to run it with only the top and bottom plate. What I got was a ton of eddy current. Every time the top disc would go, the bottom disc with the magnets on it would start rotating just as fast. This test also told me exactly where the shaking was coming from. The bottom disc was wildly out of balance. In this test right here, I took off the whole bottom half of my gravity flyer. I just wanted to see what the high voltage on the top plate was doing to the center plate. And what it actually started doing, every time it wasn't sparking, it was creating a tremendous amount of pressure and charge down towards the bottom piece of wood right there. It would actually dig in about a quarter inch within less than a minute's time. The unfortunate thing about that is that both sides had discs like that and both sides received charge. Therefore, as they pushed into the center, 
they would cancel each other out. So a lifting factor wasn't there. For every test that I did on this machine, I always took notes. What I found was Alexei put a lot of things in there that didn't make any sense. He would put this capacitor configuration along with a bunch of diodes right after his flyback transformer. Let me tell you, that's a complete mistake. Nothing works after the flyback transformer. There's too much electricity that just sparks over everywhere. Even back then, I saw that there was a coupling going on between the center plate, the two plates. There was a ring, and that the RPM of the motors mattered. Along with all my notes, I used the whiteboard a lot. I'd be able to take it and see exactly what's going on in the craft, and then I'd write it down and try to work out exactly how each part fit together. What I generally found was, I had all the blocks of how this thing was being built, but I didn't have the full picture. I was able to see certain things, but I didn't understand where they were going at that time. You would get a frequency wave or a sine wave that was going on, and then you would get one that started coupling it. I didn't understand that inside those two couplings, you'd get information. And inside those two couplings, you'd be able to amplify it. It's ironic looking back on it now, but back then, I just wasn't able to put it all together. I was working with frequencies to see what the aluminum was. I was working with frequencies to see what the hertz were on the disc and what the speed was. I was also trying to just put everything in one basket. Unfortunately, without an oscilloscope back then, I wasn't able to prove my theories right. But with that oscilloscope, I found that everything that I was doing, ironically, down to the very T, was so close, so very close to actually what was going on in the craft. Now I know what you're thinking. There's no way any of that was right. But here's my oscilloscope reading. As you can see, the coupling's going on. And when you push the piezoelectric buzzer, what happens? It starts to amplify. This is the bifiler coil that I actually attached to the bottom of my gravity flyer. You probably think to yourself, why in the world would you do that? Well, it comes down to a simple thing. I wanted to see how the magnets were reacting. If I can get the bottom plate to push down at all. What would happen if I put in a straight DC voltage? Would it do anything? Would I have to pulse the DC voltage? Let me just explain this for people who don't know this. If you don't have a pulse in that DC voltage, those magnets don't jump. They just sit there. So, you'd have to put it in that way. The unfortunate thing for this whole project is it probably added maybe, I don't know, about another pound to the whole project. While it doesn't seem like much, when your actual gravity flyer weighs three pounds, it's quite a bit of a difference when you go to put it in. So unfortunately, this idea didn't work out, but it was still a learning experience and taught me a lot about what's going on and what I can add to it and what I can't. Let me just clarify a little bit. With the straight DC voltage, they did jump once before they just sat there. But as you can see here, when you put this thing up to the gravity flyer, this thing covered the whole bottom of that center plate. Yeah, it was something to see. It was something totally different. As you can probably tell at this point, deterring me from trying to find the answer, well, that just doesn't work. As you can see in this one, what I did was I hung it from the ceiling, and I wanted to see exactly what was going on with the airflow around this thing. Every time that I put smoke around this gravity flyer, it just didn't do much. There's barely an airflow, which is something that was totally puzzling to me. You would think that there would be an airflow from the spinning disc, that it would show that it would fly some way, but it really didn't. What it actually just did was sat there in the fog. Kind of crazy. You could be sitting right next to you and you just, you would never know it. Another thing that was really cool about hanging this from the ceiling is that you were able to see that single test that we did earlier, where you held the motor in your hand and you let it spin. 
Well, you can see the spinning now, and this gravity flyer doesn't move right, it doesn't move left, it stays exactly where it's supposed to be. That test was very useful in pointing out the fact in this that it was balancing the craft out. This is the first Tesla coil that I ever built. And I did hook it to my gravity flyer and it really didn't do much. There wasn't a lot of power in this thing. It ran on 12 volts. The interesting thing at looking back on it is I actually ran it off of a ZVS. I don't know why I did it back then. I just did. But it worked. You know, for all the learning that came from this second gravity flyer, this is the picture I'll remember the most from it. High voltage plasma right on that center plate. Just an absolute gorgeous look. That's what I'll remember. But the journey's not over. I built a new one. And this is what it looked like after that. This is the third version of my gravity flyer. As much as the second version of my gravity flyer showed me everything about the mechanical workings of a gravity flyer, this third version shows you everything there is to know about high voltage, the fields they create, how a Tesla coil field is created, and how exactly they work together. This little bit of information right here is going to set the tone for exactly how this gravity flyer is going to work. However, most people generally miss this, so let me point it out again. A Tesla coil should put out an even glow on a fluorescent light up the whole side of the number two coil. As you notice, it only did it in the top five inches of the Tesla coil. It's very significant. It's telling you that the gravity flyer itself is going to add capacitance to your Tesla coil. That it became resonant in value at the top five inches where the rest of it was not resonating correctly yet. Another thing that the Tesla coil is telling you right away is that when you have high voltage on your top and bottom disc, as you turn up the Tesla coil that's connected to the center plate, you start increasing the amount of energy going in it starts to play with the high voltage and interact with it. It starts to make the high voltage spark over onto the top and bottom disc. I know some of you out there are going to try to correct my language right now. You just said that it added capacitance, but when you put a top load on it, it's a load. However, if you didn't notice already, the wire is going down the number two coil. It's not attached to it. Therefore, it's not a load, it's adding capacitance. The gravity flyer itself is acting like I just added twice the amount of windings to my number two coil, which brings down the resonance value of that coil. As we noticed, it only lit up originally in the top five inches. As we can see now, it's not only lighting up on the Tesla coil, but it's lighting up the gravity flyer in the exact same amount. When I put this thing on the ground, I'm looking for changes when I adjust the speed on the two discs. I want to see at low power what lights up and what doesn't. What I accidentally found was a point of resonance. Take a listen and see if you can't pick it up. At first, I thought my bottom disc might just be out of balance, and in partial I was right. What started to happen was I picked up extra energy inside the gravity flyer when it went into the resonance mode. It made the bottom disc change speed. That sudden change of speed started changing the whole sound and how much vibration the actual gravity flyer got. I was now in a resonance state. In order to see exactly what everything was doing, I turned the power all the way up. Tesla coil went up to 40 volts. My high voltage went up to max. Now, with everything producing energy and the high voltage just blowing off that top plate with all that plasma, 
how far can I push the field? Well, the field actually pulled out 36 inches at 40 volts on my Tesla coil and max on my high voltage. That's a pretty good distance. Pushing out the energy looks really, really cool. However, it's counterproductive. What's going on is there's so much energy going into this craft that it's sparking over. Every time that anything sparks inside this, it actually uses the energy. We're not trying to use the energy in this way. I don't want it to come out in sparks. I want it to come out in a useful voltage. So every time that it sparks over, you basically have to start your experiment over again and remove that spark. If you don't, it's a complete loss. Energy is used as explosion. We want to use the energy as implosion. That doesn't mean that you can't use high voltage as a tool. In this case, I wanted to put high voltage on this so that I can see where it was going. Because my high voltage was connected with the negative to the center plate and the positive to the bottom plate, it wanted to go in the center like a vortex. So the question then becomes, what happens when you put the high voltage positive back on the top spinning disc and the negative back on the bottom spinning disc and the center plate's a Tesla coil? Well, it no longer creates the vortex in the center. Another useful test while in this configuration is to change the distance on the bottom plate to the center plate. You give it a little extra distance, you're going to get a plasma spray. Again, just like our second gravity flyer gave us. Now, what's going on here actually? The ions are feeding into the center plate, and the center plate is absorbing them. It's not useful in any way. It's just a waste of energy. It's like a spark gap. It just looks prettier. Another thing I did while I was in this configuration is I wanted to test the frequency. As I raised the frequency up, I started to get the sparks to go away and it would send out a plasma field. As I bring the frequency down, I started to get more sparks to come over. There's a relationship that develops there. The higher the frequency, the better the spray. The lower the frequency, the more the sparks. Now that all the high voltage testing is done, we know exactly what the high voltage is doing now and how to adjust it. Now it was time to get back to the Tesla coil. What is it actually doing in this whole thing? What is it affecting in the gravity flyer? Well, you wouldn't know unless you ran it in standard configuration and then ran it in reverse. Let's get into it a little more and I'll explain. I know. Put the Tesla coil in reverse. What does that even mean? Well, it's not necessarily the Tesla coil that you're putting in reverse, more than it's the configuration you're putting it in. In this case, we're going to take the high voltage and put it to the center plate, just the positive. Then we're going to take the Tesla coil and we're going to run from the top plate all the way down to our Tesla coil and through the center and then back to the bottom plate. The Tesla coil is never attached to anything. The wire just simply goes down the number two coil. The result is the Tesla coil is now putting out a field on the top and bottom disc that comes out much thicker than it would in a standard configuration. Now that it's spinning, it's able to grow faster and faster so it gets thicker and thicker as it runs. When the high voltage is on the center plate, the Tesla coil now is able to push that high voltage out. When you do this test, just as a bit of a warning, it will set off your computer. It will start to destroy electronics in your room. If the field builds too fast, it will blow everything up. It is very important to do this in a controlled environment. This is a very dangerous thing for your electronics. For you, not so much. You don't really get affected by it. While in this configuration, you're going to find something unique. You're going to be able to turn the motor on your top a little faster. The light bulb's going to light up faster. It's going to show the little black dots in it that you would see on your screen here. In person, it looks like it's 
taking the light bulb and making it brighter and brighter and brighter in a pulse. That pulse gets super fast when you turn up the motor. As you turn it down, it gets a lot slower. This right here tells you a lot about the craft. It's telling you that if you put a pulse rate into your Tesla coil, then it's going to take it on and it's going to allow the actual energy to pulse at the same rate. This is what we call the beat frequency of the craft. Now let me be very clear about this. The rotation speed of the disc itself on the top will come out in hertz. Those hertz frequencies will go back into the Tesla coil. Because the Tesla coil is not connected directly, but the wire goes through it, it'll actually bring that frequency into the top four to five inches of your Tesla coil, and that's what your Tesla coil will resonate at on that part. The rest will oscillate like it usually does. At this point, we pretty much have what the Tesla coil does and what's unique properties is going into it. Now we did the high voltage field a little earlier and we saw the unique properties there. Now it's time to interact the two. In this experiment, what I was trying to do was take just a normal sheet of paper, just a copy of paper, and I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it on the middle disc and the upper disc. What that's going to do is it's going to connect the two electrically. And you say, well, paper's not electrified. How are you doing that? I'm placing an electric charge through static electricity from my top plate to my middle plate. What it's going to do is it's going to take the part of where the high voltage comes into the disc and it's going to show you that it's going to spark over. And there it is. As soon as it's high enough to arc over, we're getting that static. You see, this time it's clinging to there. I mean, it's not very much, but it's still doing it. In case I didn't mention this earlier, we are back in the conventional configuration. The top plate's getting the positive from the high voltage, the bottom plate's getting the negative from the high voltage, and the center plate is the Tesla coil field. Now, what's unique about this is when you get that static electricity flowing, you notice that the energy is picking up in the craft. It's able to cross between the two fields that are interacting together. They both have to be created by DC voltage. They cannot be created by AC voltage. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to a Slayer Exciter circuit. Does it put out AC? Does it put out DC? Well, it actually puts out potential, which is almost the same thing as static electricity. It's a thicker version of it. That's the stuff that's coming out of your Tesla coil. Just understand this. This is why the fields interact so much. This is why the electricity goes up. If you continue to think in your brain, that you're continuously putting an AC out of a Tesla coil that's a Slayer Exciter. You will fail in every part of it that's coming up and how this thing is built. Trust me, I know. This is one of the biggest understandings you're going to have to get over in order to understand this properly. Once you do, things will start to fall in line. Computer, let's see if we can't get it up a bit higher. You can see voltage is going off. You can't hear my computer at all, right? Well, there it went. Let's see if we can make that computer go off a couple times. Doesn't like that high voltage right now. I used my Gravito meter on my Gravity Flyer. How this works is there's no batteries inside the Gravito meter. None at all. It basically is set up to pick up fields. The red light picks up the Tesla coil field. The green light picks up the static electricity field. Now, within a few minutes of having this running, my green light went out. I need to put a stronger one in it. However, it tells you something about the amount of static electricity in the room. It tells you that I'm producing a ton of it when I'm starting to play around with it. That's one of the things you need to understand. When you start doing this project, like I did, what I learned, 
was that there's a ton of static electricity. You're going to have to get that Tesla coil field stronger. It's only stronger when you rotate it. However, this design does not allow for a rotating Tesla coil. It's one of the failures of the design, that's for sure. However, it still holds in a field, so you have to create the field that can fill up that Tesla coil bubble that it creates around the craft. That's how it's going to work. Now we saw the Gravito meter. Now I'm going to use a static electricity meter. I'm going to put it in various places and see which side's positive, which side's negative on the static electricity that it's putting out. It's important that you have both. One is looking for fields. The other one's strictly looking for static electricity. We're looking around to see if we have static electricity on our top plate, bottom plate, and center plate. This is getting way more advanced the more and more things we're throwing at it because it continues to tell you more as it's working. Every once in a while, you're going to get a field flip. Either the entire thing goes positive or the entire thing goes negative. And it's just changing the amount of static electricity going in one direction to the other. At a normal pace, it stays positive on the top and negative on the bottom. However, the center plate itself may show positive on the top and negative on the bottom on the same exact plate. You know, in testing, sometimes you run across something that looks so strange. Notice the temperature, 74, 75 on my center plate. I have the Tesla coil running at 40 volts. Most people would understand this as there's something wrong here. Well, if you think about it as your Tesla coil number two coil connected to your gravity flyer as a load, yeah, there might be something wrong there. It would probably heat up over time. However, this thing continues to get colder over time. What'll happen is it'll get down to the 60 degree mark in certain points. Why? Because the Tesla coil wire is not connected to anything. It's just put down the center of the Tesla coil. That means I'm stealing the energy from the Tesla coil. I am pulling cold energy out. The energy from a vacuum is what I'm taking. I'm taking that from the Tesla coil itself. Therefore, my plate will continue to stay cold. Is there a lot of energy on it? Well, you could touch it and it's not going to shock you, but it will burn your finger every time. You know, I couldn't help myself right here. There's a lot of stuff out there that says Lexi went ahead and put magnets on the top and the bottom. Well, I just wanted to show what it would look like if he did. In this example, it's another one of my gravity flyers. I just wanted to put them on top and bottom and show you what happens to the center plate. The center plate takes a massive beating here. It does, it moves around, but that's not resonating it. That's just simply vibrating it and it's doing it in an unproductive way. At this point, I had to run some more fog on it. I just wanted to see what the fields are doing. We saw it on the second gravity flyer that we ran some fog around it. This is the third gravity flyer, or you can say this is the fourth one because it's another gravity flyer that I have, but it is still version three. It does do something, but not a whole lot. It pushes it down and then pushes it out. That's about the most you get out of it, but it's just showing you that no matter what the field is, you're not going to be able to pick it up with the fog. This test right here was the first time that I connected my piezoelectric buzzer to my ultrasound machine. What you're going to see is that I'm going to put in 6 volts and I'm going to put in 2 amps. What that's going to do is it's turning it on. But what happens is the beep frequency of the actual gravity flyer starts to take over. As it does, you start to hear this piezoelectric buzzer go off. It's because it's a receiver and a transmitter at the same time. The voltage that I put into it is not high enough to cut it off yet. So you continuously hear it clicking.
We saw earlier what a piece of paper does to the field. It brings out the static electricity. So what would a dryer sheet do? Well, in order to find out, we just had to do it. So I'm going to intentionally saturate the field. I'm going to create more static electricity than should be created at this time. Basically, I'm going to hit fast forward on this machine so that I can get it out faster. You're going to see me also tap the center plate. What am I doing? Because the center plate resonates, it's in a certain octave. Every time that you tap the center plate, you change the octave. I'm looking for the fifth octave, the octave that actually is aluminum. I'm going to resonate it at aluminum. What the result of that is, is that the craft's going to start to pick up energy. It's going to somewhere just pull up a lot of energy in it the upper and lower motor are going to move faster. Another thing that you're going to notice is the amount of electricity that's coming off the high voltage is going to continue to spark faster and faster and faster. That's where the more energy is coming into. I'll put the audio on so that you can hear it for yourself. Just picked up a lot of energy as soon as I tap that thing. Right back down a little bit. Like I said before, I don't get deterred very easily. So I put this thing through another round of testing. So what you're going to see here is my gravity flyer. You're also going to see my oscilloscope. And it's picking up different ring frequencies. Now, there's one probe that's next to my Tesla coil. There's another one next to my gravity flyer. That's it. There's no three probes in this, but I'm getting three distinct rings. Why? One's on my Tesla coil. One's going coming from my center plate. And the next one or last one is my actual magnets. They're pulling in frequencies from the earth as a ring. All of them are combining together. I have them spread out, but when you overlap them, they're exactly the same. One of the things that's hardest to show is the magnets themselves. Why are they getting a ringing frequency? Well, if you've ever built a Bedini SG circuit, you would understand this. It has a very distinct ring. It's the same ring that a Tesla coil gets. That's why I know it's the magnets. So we're doing testing today, and I just want to show you a couple things up front. First of all, when you push the button, the piezo buzzer itself goes off on the gravity flyer. I just wanted you to watch this and listen, and you can hear it clearly go off. This one right here is really hard to hear. What you're going to listen for is a little bit of a sound. When I turn the dial down to the bottom, it's going to make a click. When I move it back up towards the top, it's going to make a click. Now, that sound in person is loud, but on the microphone, it's barely showing up. Understand, this is what Alexi's listening for when he's moving this dial. Did you catch that? It went You know why building this gravity flyer? I really don't think many people got this far into it. They look at it, they dismiss it, but they haven't dived really deep into it. I have. And I want to show you something more. 
we're going to go ahead and push the button again on the ultrasound device, but we're going to see it on the oscilloscope this time. And this time I want you to watch as it amplifies the waves. See that? Let me get the measure again. It's amplifying part of the signal. It's showing up in the blue. So the blue right there is our gravity flyer. See how it's moving around every time you hit it? This is why it's so hard to line it up to hit it right. You see that one? That one was a good one. Just so we can put a cap on this piezoelectric buzzer and the ultrasound device. So we know when we push the button what it's doing. It's basically changing the octave in the center plate. Now I can tap that center plate and get it to change the octave in it. But I just want you to notice that it's not doing its job here. Look at the waves. They're 180 degrees out of phase. I am not in the correct octave. So what happens when I tap it? I start to get closer to the correct octave every time. These two frequencies must align. We can see that they want to be in the same area, but we cannot get them to hit the same. You see the amplification go up, but we can't hit the amplification unless it's on both of them. That's our problem here. That's why we're not popping off the ground, because I'm 180 degrees out of phase. So let's just ask the question, why isn't it doing what we want it to do? Either the piezoelectric disc is not big enough and can't provide a heavy enough force, or the Tesla coil itself is not at a high enough uh, amount going in, the input isn't high enough, in order to get this thing to hit hard enough when the button's pushed. It could be either one. We're going to have to explore both things to figure it out. All right, we're getting ready to start testing on our gravity flyer. I wanted to show you something. Here's my gravity flyer right here. We are connected... To our Tesla coil, right? We're just going down the throat of it, just like that. We're not hooked to anything. Here's the little wire that comes off of it right here, so you can see it. Now, I want to show you this on the oscilloscope. This is kind of cool. So, let's look at the circuit real quick for the ZBS. We're connected in down here. Just so you know, on the ZBS circuit, the wire on your right hand side when you're looking at it this way with the power source there is always to the bottom and the other wire clips on and goes around the coil to whichever one you're going to get to to get your proper resonance now we just have a simple right here 40 volt power source here's the cool thing watch the magic now people wonder why the gravity flyer gets in the megahertz watch You see that right there? So we are just barely tipping it. And that's at the very bottom right there. Understand this. You're not going to be running that all the time. This is where feedback happens. So you can see we're already doing good. We're going to be able to hit the megahertz range. So let's clip this up right here. I can feel the heat in there. It did not like that at all. That's a good sign for this. So let's see what we get now. We're getting a better signal, not a great signal. Bring it up one. Now we got something. Okay, so let's take a look real quick. 
370, 360. Now, this thing resonates with it attached to it around 340, so we're close. But just check this out. We went from clipping it at the very bottom to just a couple coils up. What does this signify in our gravity flyer? When we do the feedback, it's pushing down to the megahertz range. When it comes out of the feedback loop, it goes back to the regular resonating frequency. Now, I just want to tell you this. This is the third version of my Tesla coil. It is not my last version of my Tesla coil. At this point, I hope you guys understand this. I'm building the actual electronics to match the gravity flyer. I'm changing the resonance frequency. As you can see, when I put the wire down the Tesla coil, it's adding capacitance. So just understand this. It runs quite a bit different than your average Tesla coil. It does not resonate properly without the gravity flyer. With the gravity flyer, I get perfect resonance. There's a big difference in the two. If you've ever built a Tesla coil, you understand that. How I'm pulling out the energy is something totally different. It's cold energy coming out of the top. A lot of you may not understand that. That's okay. But that's exactly what's going on here. Pulling energy out of it from the center. I'm stealing it from the Tesla coil. I'm doing it by adding capacitance, not load. I wanted to show you my little cart. I now put this thing on there and go outside and test. It started to get a little scary in my garage. I'm starting to produce a ton of power. I can get fields out of this that go 8 to 10 feet in each direction. This gravity flyer has a ton of power and it all has to do with amplifying the piezoelectric disc with each of my Tesla coil, my center plate, and my magnets. You know the question that always comes up when everybody looks at my videos on the gravity flyer, they always ask one question. Did you get it to lift? Well. I can tell you that it's not lifting in the air completely. I can also tell you that not all the legs stay on the ground. You can take that for what you will. I have about another 40 videos with a test to show. I don't necessarily know that I want to show them just yet. It's not because I don't want to get the information out there. It's because I want to evaluate them first and put out a video like this where I can explain what I'm doing piece by piece. Some of the stuff in here you're going to have to know a lot of this information that's in this video to even comprehend it. It's not normal. It's not normal the way it acts. It's not normal the way it reacts to things. So there's going to be a lot to learn. You can decide whether you want to watch that or not. I just want to tell you through doing this whole project, there are three totally different things going on here based on exactly how you build it. In the original version, this is more like a field generator. It generates a Tesla coil field, it generates a static field. When you remove the center plate and put in a plastic plate, it acts more like a capacitor and it changes the whole build. Now, there's a version of this that's coming up that's gonna be totally different than all of that. It's more of a solid state version and I'm gonna show testing on that as well, but not until the future. guys. Hopefully you understand what goes into this. There are a ton of tests and this is just a cut down, short down version of what I actually do. I've done testing on this thing for six straight months. Trust me, there's a lot of footage that I just haven't shown yet, but I don't want to put anybody in the wrong direction. If you do not understand how the Tesla coil is working with the gravity flyer, the whole project is lost. The Tesla coil is the absolute main thing to it. The rest of it's going to be spark. It's going to be the resonance in the center. It's going to be the harmonics that the plates put off. If you don't understand the harmonics, you're going to have to research and see what the octaves are. Guys, there's a lot that goes into this type of project. Again, we're building anti-gravity. It's not supposed to be easy. However, I hope that I've shown you a lot of tests. I hope that I've shown you enough in here so that you can start to realize what it is you need to do in yours. A lot of people say change the center plate, change the outside plates, change them to different things. 
When you get to the understanding of this, please get this. The aluminum plates are magnetized. I know that sounds wrong. In every fiber of my being, I want to tell you it's wrong. But I also have to tell you it's right. And I don't know exactly how to explain that. The field builds around them. So you're getting a magnetic field around all three plates. They act magnetized. Completely sounds wrong. I understand that, but it's absolutely true. So, that's a perfect material you want. It keeps the field on the outside of the aluminum while the aluminum itself stays the way it is. If you use anything else, the fields don't produce. So, take it for what you will. Anyway, this is a fun, fun project and I'm going to continue to make videos on it. And I'm going to continue to show exactly how this thing works. And, in the near future here, I'm going to show this thing going up on two legs. Then I'm going to show it going up on one. You're going to see this thing is absolutely an amazing machine. And we've just scratched the surface on it. I hope you tune in to see that. Thank you very much. And have yourself a great day.